Hello, everyone. I want to thank Michael Saylor for being on today. It is an honor to have him on to talk about Bitcoin, all things Bitcoin. And we're going to get into every nuance of it. Michael, thank you for being on today. Yeah, happy to be here. So I brought Michael on to discuss a few things. And I wanted to start with the beginning, Satoshi Nakamoto. Now, the original Satoshi Nakamoto white paper is available for everybody to see. I've read this. I think everybody should, whether you like it or you don't. And I just want to start off by reading. I have it on this other screen. I'll flash it up on the screen here for everybody afterwards in the editing. Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, a purely peer-to-peer -peer electronic version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. Now, initially, what are your thoughts about this, Michael? Just that statement alone. <clears throat> well, I think the significance uh, here is um, for the first time in the history of the human race, we develop a technology uh, to maintain um, a shared ledger without a trusted counterparty. So for thousands and thousands of years, uh, if you wanted to actually keep track of transactions, you had to have a bank or a merchant that kept the books. And the whole idea of Satoshi's was, what if uh, we didn't have to trust a bank or trust a bookkeeper? What if we actually all shared the books and we did it in a decentralized fashion. That's, uh, that's profound because if you think about what's perfect money, the, the theoretical perfect money would be a shared immutable ledger telepathically planted into everybody's head so that all 8 billion people on the planet had the same exact understanding of who owed what to whom. And if you, uh, if you wanted to go one step further, Right, uh, the Nakamoto consensus is we're going to give everybody on the planet that shared ledger, we're going to make it incorruptible, and then we're going to cap the supply of the asset to 21 million. And that makes it ultimately conservative. So that was a profound idea that was, uh, that was offered in the white paper. In essence, it was per a perfect money on a shared immutable ledger. And uh, no one had, uh, had been able to figure out how to do that until Satoshi Nakamoto offered up Nakamoto consensus. Now, I believe a lot has changed since the original Satoshi Nakamoto white paper. We have Bitcoin forking left and right. And there is some argument about what is so Bitcoin is supposed to be. And so I'm wondering if you had any thoughts on that in, okay, we're talking about peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. Does it still serve that purpose or should it be viewed as something else today? Well, the, I mean, the idea is always, how do I take a block of money, like a, a million dollars and move it from one part of the earth to the other part of the earth instantly for free and store it on a computer? That's the idea. Uh, people tried to create that 40, 50 times, and all the experiments fail before Bitcoin. So Bitcoin wasn't the first. Uh, it was just the first one to work. And then subsequent to that, people copied it 20,000 times. So there have been 20,000 other coins that were, were, were uh, launched. I mean, you can copy and paste the code or cut and paste it and launch your own network tomorrow. So thousands and thousands of times people created other, other versions. And, and uh, the question is, which network is going to be dominant? And uh, figuring out which network is going to be the dominant one is kind of like asking the question, which species of small mammal will dominate in North America? <laughs> Well, you know, you could launch 10,000 of them and only one of them can hold that, that spot in the ecosystem. So it's very Darwinian. And um, over the course of the next 12 years, you saw other, other uh, versions of cryptocurrencies launched. And the most famous uh, example of a fight between various cryptocurrencies was the fork wars or the block size wars that took place around 20, from 2015 to 2018. 
And that's when Bitcoin was forked off into Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Satoshi Vision and, and certain other varieties. And, and the debate was, what's the right protocol? Which one is going to be most censorship resistant? Which one will be most robust, most secure? Uh, which one uh, meets the needs of the market? Uh, and what are the needs of the market? Does the market value hard money? Uh, or does the market value some functional, fast, speedy medium of exchange? You know, lots of debate. Uh, where we are today is Bitcoin's the winner. And Bitcoin's the winner of, with 20,000 competitors and everybody that's launched a clone or, or sometimes they'll take it and they'll try to add more functionality to it or they'll add more performance to it. And all of those have failed compared to Bitcoin because Bitcoin's protocol is engineered ideally to, to do the job of long-term digital store of value. So um, I, I think that the best way to think of it is Bitcoin has risen uh, through a, a very Darwinian open competition in the market to be the most robust, most secure, uh, most accepted, most trusted digital asset network in the world. Um, I wanna come back to this topic of Bitcoin versus other cryptos, but I wanted to highlight something before we move on. Now the original Satoshi coins, there's, for those who aren't aware, and you, you can explain it better than I can, but there are some coins that were originally mined um, back way back, and it's worth billions and billions of dollars right now today. And my question to you is, those haven't moved, okay? What if tomorrow they started to move? Would that undermine Bitcoin at all? Is there some faith in that these coins will remain where they are and that gives some structure to Bitcoin itself? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's a benefit to Bitcoin that they've never moved. And if they were to move, it would undermine Bitcoin. I don't think it would be fatal or catastrophic, but it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be positive. And to understand the significance of the coins, we have to go back to the theory of property versus the theory of securities. Um, if I create a network as a company and I have control over that network, if my developers can change the protocol and if I own a large chunk of that network, then that begins to look like a security in the eyes of the law. Um, like MicroStrategy stock is a security. If you launch a company and you have equity, it's a security. And if it is a security, then you have ethical legal obligations to disclose uh, the disposition of those securities to the general public when you sell it to them. The thing that's always been very special about Bitcoin is what they call the immaculate conception. The idea that the network was launched uh, without any intent uh, to make money. There was, there was not an ICO. There was never an IPO or an ICO. There was not a venture capitalist involved. There's no group of developers that own 20% of the Bitcoin network. There's no foundation that control the treasury. Satoshi is the founder, but a synonymous founder that uh, disappeared within a few years after launching the network. And the coins that were mined by Satoshi or, or allegedly mined by Satoshi never moved. And so the implication is uh, this is not a security. This is property. If, if I wanted to make it a security, I would launch a coin, sell a third of it to the general public, keep a third of it for myself, have a foundation that actually controls the software development, change the protocol from time to time and continue as the leader. And that sounds like a company. And there's nothing wrong with a company except for the fact that if you wanna sell company equity to the general public, Securities laws say you should sell it pursuant to a registration statement and make fair disclosures. And if you don't believe in securities laws, if you think they're antiquated, I could just roll the clock back to biblical laws, which just say you shouldn't lie, cheat, and steal, right? And so forgetting about the law, the ethical underpinning here is if you have half of the supply of the coins and you can change the supply of the coins, and I don't know that, and then you sell it to me, you have an ethical obligation to me to disclose that. And if you sell it to me saying, oh, well, there's 20 million coins, and then it turns out there's 30 million coins, 
and you change it, even for good reason, right? You have uh, you have uh, undermined, right? The uh, the representations you made to me, and that gives you that leaves you with liability. So, Bitcoin is special in the entire crypto ecosystem because it's generally acknowledged by everyone to be property and not a security. And the things that make it property include the fact that there isn't a central group of founders, no one controls it, there's no leader, there's no entity that benefited by launching it. And the fact that the, the Satoshi coins never moved imply that Satoshi gave this as a gift to the world, as, as opposed to Satoshi was a business person launching a company with a company equity for the benefit of a small group of people. So that brings me around to, you know, all these coins have come up and they've tried to sort of take what Bitcoin has, make it better, make it more functional, make it faster and so on. Um, and a lot of the concern right now for, for those who are skeptical of Bitcoin would say, well, if Bitcoin is here right now um, and it's, let's say, lacking speed, well, what's to say that they won't be able to create Bitcoin version two and make it faster and therefore more attractive to businesses or to countries or what have you? And that would attract more of the money towards it versus Bitcoin. And then there's this never ending uh, features addition to this you know, protocol and therefore you know, you can't have stability in this way. So what, what would you say to that? I would say you have to understand it as a protocol, not a product. So if you're, if you're launching the iPhone, the iPhone one gives way to the iPhone two, to the three, to the four, to the five, to the six. It's a product. You keep upgrading it every year, or every two years. On the other hand, uh, base 10 math, where I have the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and zero, more of a protocol. Because you can have base two math, base four math, base eight math, base 16 math. And so you might be of the opinion that base 16 math is better and have all sorts of arguments for why it's more efficient. Or maybe you think, you know, the, the computer science people thought base two math was better, like binary, you know, right? We built computers with binary, yet people don't use base two math. And so ask yourself the question, why is it that we stuck to the base 10 protocol, just like the English language? Right? There's a word love in the English language. Maybe you have a better word. Maybe you wish to change it, but the language tends to stick around. Um, the width of a, of a railroad track is, uh, is based on the width of a Roman war chariot. It's 2,000 years old. Now you could make, you could, you could make the, the railroad ties three inches wider or three inches shorter, and you could come along today and say, I really think we should make them two feet wider. And you'd have all these arguments like, you know, the, the volume in the train car is greater and, and we can fit three people in a car instead of two people in a car and we're more comfortable. But ask yourself the question, why is it that we don't change everything by plus two feet? It's because like, you know, we spent hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars to create infrastructure the other way, which was good enough. And so once a protocol uh, sets in place, if it's good enough protocol, then it's not really about changing the protocol. You can change the car that runs on the road, right? And, uh, and you can use uh, the English language differently, but you're not changing the underlying protocol. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't need to be faster. It doesn't need to be more functional. For example, in New York City, the city is sitting on top of bedrock schist. You know how old that bedrock is? 400 million years. 400 million years. Do you have to change it? Like, you can build different buildings on it, right? You can put different companies in the buildings. You can change the menu in the restaurant, in the building, on the bedrock. The menu changes every few months. The company changes every few years. The building changes every few decades. The stone is there for hundreds of millions of years. Bitcoin is, in essence, the, the foundation of the cyber economy. <clears throat> what you need to do 
is know that you have a block of energy, say a billion dollars worth of energy, one twenty-one millionth of all the energy in cyberspace. You're building on that block of energy. Once you've built that block of energy, you can build any number of companies and applications and products. The one thing that's, that's, that's and if you want speed, right? You, you build an application like Square Cash App is an application running on Bitcoin. You can move a million transactions an hour for free on Cash App. And you can build all sorts of beautiful functionality and beautiful colors and build it into every type of product. And, and it's fine. And you can change it every month or every three months. You don't need to change Bitcoin to create application functionality. And uh, I think you, you see that all around. So people that there are certain people in the crypto economy that think you have to change the layer ones and put all the functionality in the layer ones, but, but they're dismissing the layer two and the layer three. It's kind of like if I build something in New York City, right? I've got, I've got the granite or the, the schist. I've got the building. I've got the company. That's one way to look at it. And they're each vibrating at different frequencies. Another way to think of it is I have... Um, I have uh, mineral energy in the form of schist. I have uh, metallic energy in the form of steel. And I have a, another form of energy called glass. And I build a building on top of bedrock out of steel with glass. And you need all three. And so to say, well, we just need to build the entire thing out of uh, schist and it's too heavy and I can't see through it. And so I need. I need God to change, you know, change physics and make rock that I can see through that weighs one one hundredth as much. It's just the wrong way to look at it because you end up building a glass house on a glass foundation with glass, you know, beams. And it does take a rocket science to figure out that you end up with something very brittle and fragile. And that's not what you want. What you want is... Uh, is multiple elements, all different forms of energy, all, all in essence vibrating at different frequencies. Bitcoin, <clears throat> Bitcoin is, is the foundation. And, uh, and when you engineer it, you want to engineer something that is secure and durable forever. What number one criteria is, I want to know no one's going to change it for a thousand years. That's what I, do I need the functionality and speed? No, I, right? I just need to know that it won't change for a thousand years, right? I'll, I'll leave you with one last metaphor and we'll go on to the next question, right? You either want to build a skyscraper clad in uh, granite framed in steel with glass windows on a foundation of schist bedrock in Manhattan, or you're going to build a glass house on the beach in the Caribbean like the island of Barbuda. And it's going to be beautiful and sexy and fun for about 10 years. And then a, a hurricane is going to come along once every 10 years. And the wall of water is going to come over the beach. It's going to wipe out the glass house. It's going to level the beach. And you're going to have to rebuild it again because that's just the way it is. And if you see the world as you want your beach house, you know, made out of glass, then that's fine. It's just a different frequency, I wouldn't store my intergenerational wealth on the beach in Barbuda. So to shift gears, one of the things I talk about on this channel all the time is what's happening with the Federal Reserve, the central banks. And right now we see all central banks are going towards higher interest rates, at least for now. So um, there's been a lot of talk about how different assets will respond in a higher interest rate environment. Now, let's be honest, interest rates are still super low. Uh, but the expectation is because of higher inflation that we will see much higher levels of interest rates. How do you think Bitcoin will respond uh, you know, as a result of, let's say, moderately higher interest rates? What, what is your assumption there? Not, not necessarily the price, but... Does it change anything? I think that if you're a short-term macro trader, like you're thinking in terms of hours or days or even weeks, you're really concerned about that question. But I think that if you have a time frame of four to 10 years, 
I think there's a different question, which is why are the interest rates going up and, uh, and what is the macroeconomic environment? And I would, say, I would say you probably shouldn't even buy Bitcoin if, you're, uh, if your time horizon is less than four years because you're a trader. And if you're a trader, you're probably not gonna care about anything that I have to say. You're just looking at, at, at whether it's correlated or uncorrelated and, and throwing lots of money around without thinking about it. I think if you're really a deep thinker or a macroeconomic investor, the bigger issue is we have monetary inflation. The, the money supply or the currency supply is expanding. I think the news today in Turkey was 70% inflation in Turkish lira. We probably got something in the range of 15 to 20% currency inflation in the US dollar and the Euro. We've got 40% inflation in like an Argentine peso or more. So what you have is an inflationary environment. We know the CPI, which is, which is a, which is a uh, a manipulated measure of inflation. It's actually the lowest inflation that one could reasonably measure, I think. Uh, it's like seven and a half percent, six and a half, seven, eight percent in the US and Europe. And these are 40 year highs. So the CPI is 8%, but the, but the actual asset inflation rate is double to triple that. So the reason that interest rates are going up is because there's pressure on the central banks to get the inflation under control. And, and their one tool to do it is raise interest rates. But they're not going to stop the inflation because the inflation is caused by excessive money printing, budget deficits, and the wars, and political policies, domestic and foreign policies. And these policies continue. So given the fact that we have uh, an expansive currency environment, and what you can see is the price of, of food and energy and scarce resources keeps going up. The question really is, if I have some money, what should I invest in? And the answer is you don't want to hold currency because the currency is collapsing in value. You know, the, the US dollars lost 99.7% of its value over 90 years. I mean, and that's the winner. The losers are, are losing 99.9% .9 of their value over 100 years. So the currencies are all collapsing. So I, I don't want to hold the currency. I don't want to hold bonds because bonds are currency derivatives. You know, you know, I'm going to basically, you're going to give me a million dollars and I'm going to give you interest on the million dollars at 3% for 30 years. Then I'll give you the million dollars back. And in 30 years, the dollars will buy 10% of what they buy right now. So that's even worse. You don't want to hold a value stock that generates, it's valued on cash flows because if a stock is valued on cash flows without growth, it looks just like a bond. Right, it might be slightly better than a bond, but if you if the currency is losing ten percent of its value a year and you can't raise your cash flows or raise your prices, you, you have to increase your cash flows ten percent a year to offset a ten percent currency collapse. Right, so when the currency is collapsing at seventy percent a year, like Turkey, the company you own has to raise its prices in Turkish lira seventy percent or. Sorry, you have to you have to raise your your prices by an amount such that your cash flows would increase by seventy percent, so that you hold parity in value. So equities are currency derivatives, partial currency derivatives. Bonds are almost complete currency derivatives. Commercial real estate is a partial currency derivative. The currency is currency derivative, right? It's a full currency derivative. So what do I own? And the answer is, I want to own scarce property scarce desirable property. What is it that you own that an affluent, intelligent person will want to buy from you in a decade? That's the question you have to ask yourself. So if you're owning things that will last a decade, right? I mean, if, if you buy a car that's not going to last a decade, it's not really an asset, it's depreciating. But maybe you own a sports team or a Picasso painting. I don't know. Well, will people want to buy gold from you in a decade? Will they want to own own uh, the building that you own in a decade, right? Uh, well, they want to own the intellectual property rights. Well, it, it all depends. Uh, Bitcoin is scarce desirable asset because it represents digital property. If I own a million dollars worth of buildings in Moscow in a decade, who's going to want to buy them from me? Presumably affluent, intelligent Russians, but will an affluent, intelligent uh, British person or Chinese 
business person or American want to own that asset. The same is true. Uh, you own a million dollars worth of buildings in Nigeria. Who's going to want to buy them in 10 years? Who's going, to, who's going to want to buy what you own? If you own a million dollars worth of Argentine pesos for the next 10 years, they're going to be worth $10,000, right? So you're not going to want to own that, but owning a million dollars worth of buildings in Buenos Aires is only going to appeal to someone that wants to live and work or use that real estate in Buenos Aires, and you're going to pay the tax and the maintenance cost in between now and then. So Interest rates are going up because there's macroeconomic headwinds blowing. The real problem is inflation. If inflation's running 20% and the interest rates uh, go to 2%, they're not going to stop the problem of currency collapse. They're just going to create a, a near-term turbulence. And if you're a trader, you may get caught in that turbulence. But ultimately, um, if you're an investor and you're concerned about preserving your wealth to give to your children or your grandchildren, then uh, whenever you're in an inflationary environment, your, your strategy is simple. I have to convert my weak currency into a strong currency, ideally convert my weak property into strong property. And that strong property, I want to move out of the country. I want to move it out of the jurisdiction of a politician that may confiscate it or tax it away, right? And that, that's why, you know, converting a million pesos, a million dollars of pesos into a million dollars of dollars in bonus errors won't help you because eventually the politicians will freeze your bank accounts, convert it back into pesos and devalue it 20 to one. That won't help. Right? Converting a million dollars of pesos into a million dollars of dollars and then uh, buying a million dollars worth of big tech stocks in the US may be a better idea. If the big tech stocks are monopolies, they'll be able to raise their prices, hold their cash flows, and hold value. Monopolies will be fine. Right? What is a monopoly? It's scarce, desirable property. If I offered you a monopoly with unfettered ability to change the price of something that have, like oxygen, sell oxygen to New York City, you know, you're probably going to do OK. Right. The problem with with even monopolies, though, is over time, monopolies get regulated. Right. Like like in theory, the richest person ought to be the person that sells water in New York City, but they're not the richest person because the New Yorkers get together and they decide that they don't want the water company to raise the price of water to $100 a gallon, even though you'd pay it if you were thirsty. So what, what can I buy that's going to hold its value over time that represents scarce, desirable property? Not just scarce, because there's a lot of things that are scarce that aren't desirable, right? Scarce, desirable property. And uh, <clears throat> I think one of the obvious things is digital property, right? If I created a city in cyberspace with 21 million blocks and nobody could make any more and it was going to last for a thousand years and it was the dominant city and everyone wanted to live there, would you want to own one of those blocks? And I think the answer is yeah. And that city is called Bitcoin. So that actually brings me into the next question, which is you've got companies like MicroStrategy and now countries, uh, El Salvador being one, and now uh, was this Central African Central Republic, African Republic. Yeah, being the second one that I'm aware of, actually adopting it uh, as their currency. Now, you can obviously speak uh, for, the, for the companies first and foremost, um, and, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on that in, in the why would a company want to do that? Like, why is that beneficial versus, for instance, Warren Buffett, who we'll talk more about in a second, uh, Warren Buffett holding on to US debt as their form of cash, uh, you know, $150 billion worth at some point, holding on to that as basically liquid cash ready to go uh, in case they want to acquire more companies and so on. Uh, and also countries, why would they want to make another type of currency, actual legal tender, would you not consider that that would say, well, you know, uh, that's going to undermine our own currency here. So why would they want to do that? And, and uh, you know, both the, both the country perspective and the company perspective. 
if you're holding a currency um, like the dollar and the dollar is inflating at 15% a year, then that means you lose 15% of your wealth every year, which means that over about four years, four and a half years, you lose half of your wealth. Over the course of 10 years, you lose 80% of your wealth. So it doesn't make a good savings account. It makes a good checking account. It's probably good to have one or two months of uh, expenses in the dollar. But if you're holding a year to 10 years worth of expenses in the dollar, then in a decade, you're gonna be much poorer. If you're holding the peso and the peso is losing 40 to 50% of its value a year, it's even worse, right? Over the course of 10 years, you lose 95% of your wealth. So weak, a weak currency is one that's inflating rapidly, that's collapsing. Weak currencies make sense. If you lived in Venezuela, you would use the Bolivar for about a day. You would hold uh, you know, a peso or something for a month. You might hold the dollar for a year but you would want to hold Bitcoin for a decade. So they're all different uh, strength currencies. So um, why would a, a company or country want to use Bitcoin? Well, uh, you don't want to use Bitcoin as your medium of exchange. You want to use the dollar. The dollar is really probably the best medium of exchange in the world. Probably, all 8 billion people on the planet would probably use the dollar if they were given a choice. The only reason they don't is they can't get their hands on dollars. You know, if you're, a, if you're a working class person in Zambia, Central Africa, or the Central African Republic or something, you can't get dollars. That's why they don't use dollars. But if they could, they would. But let's say you have a billion dollars on your treasury as a company or a country. If you store that money in US sovereign debt and you're holding a billion dollars of T-bills, and if the US currency is inflating at 18% a year, that means every four years you lose half your money. Okay, so another way to say it is it's costing you $180 million a year, or it's costing your citizens $180 million a year to use that as your reserve asset. And it will cost them $500 million in four years. And it will cost them $750 million in the 10 year or in the eight years. So it's very expensive to use a depreciating currency as a reserve asset, right? It's so expensive that in essence, it impoverishes you. For example, my company had $500 million of cash and we were generating $100 million in cash flow a year. Well, when the inflation rate gets to 15%, then you're losing $75 million in, in wealth on your treasury in the same year that you're generating 100 million in cash flow. If you have to pay tax on that cash flow, you have 75 million after tax and you have a $75 million loss. So that means that a profitable company working as hard as they can doing 100,000 things right every year makes no progress. When the inflation rate doubles to 30%, or 25%, you're actually getting poorer working as hard as you can. So another way to say this is the road to serfdom is working exponentially harder for a currency growing exponentially weaker. You wanna take the extreme, imagine yourself working as hard as you can in Argentina while the currency is losing 40% of its value a year. What you can see is it's utterly hopeless and impossible no matter how hard you work you have to work 40% harder per year to say the same, right? Impossible, right? So the reason that a country or a company would want to switch to a Bitcoin standard from the US dollar standard for your treasury asset is because instead of losing $20 billion a year, they would be accreting or making $20 billion a year because they picked the right asset to store their economic wealth in. You take a country like China, if China's holding a trillion dollars worth of US debt and the US inflates the money supply by 20%, the Chinese people pay $200 billion for that privilege. 
In fact, they're probably holding 3x that much debt. So the US is in essence exporting inflation that cost the Chinese $600 billion a year, every year, okay? It's, it's a pretty profound idea. Now you could call it security, like maybe the US's greatest export is security. People pay us hundreds of billions of dollars a year for the privilege of using our currency as a reserve asset and using our banking system. But, you know, if you're a country and, you're, and your citizens are working as hard as they can, like maybe I'm basically shipping oil. If I ship $100 billion of oil and I export it every year, but I lose $100 billion by holding the U.S. debt, I'm in essence selling my oil for nothing, impoverishing myself. And so why would you switch? Well, <laughs> Because if I told you everything you do the rest of your life is going to be worth nothing, or you could switch your savings technology and everything you did in the rest of your life would be worth a lot and your children could live a comfortable life, which of the two strategies would you choose? So Warren Buffett, you may have seen it at the recent Berkshire Hathaway conference. He made statements about Bitcoin. He said, if you let me buy all the Bitcoin in the world for $25, I wouldn't take it. Now, he made an interesting point related to, for instance, land and real estate. And he said something to the effect of the real estate, I can put a renter there. That renter will pay me money every month. I could have land and we can have agriculture growing. I could sell the agriculture. Um, you know, So he, he's trying to value the asset and obviously that makes complete sense. So where does Bitcoin fall in with that? Because for Bitcoin itself, you're simply holding onto this asset. And I, my assumption is waiting for the appreciation in that asset. And you know, where does the benefit come in for somebody like, not necessarily a Warren Buffett, but, but an investor? Yeah, I think what Warren, uh misses is that uh, land is, uh, is a form of physical capital, right? And housing is a form of physical capital and people will pay you rent on the farmland so they can farm it and they'll pay you rent on the housing so they can live in it. Uh, Bitcoin is just digital capital and people will pay you rent to borrow that as well. So if you had a million dollars of Bitcoin, you could loan it out to someone and get a yield on it right now. In fact, that's what makes it desirable. Um, if I had a million dollars of farmland in Argentina, I could only rent it to a farmer in Argentina. If I had a million dollars of apartments in Argentina, I could only rent that to people that wanted to live in Argentina. If I had a million dollars of Bitcoin in Argentina, I could loan it to a capitalist in Singapore that would probably pay me 8% yield. And then if someone in London heard about it, they might pay me 9% yield. And occasionally someone might decide they want to pay me 18% yield or 4% yield. And so it's just capital. And if you understand it as tokenized capital or, or digital capital, then the question is, do I want to convert my million dollars of capital into pure digital energy and loan it to any, anybody in the world and rent it to anybody in the world on a network? Or do I want to convert it into, into physical energy like farmland? And then of course, which country do I want the farmland in, right? And you can't move it, right? And do I want to turn it into an apartment? And the question is what city do I want the apartment to be in? So, you know, Warren is 92 years old. I don't think Warren has spent a hundred hours thinking about Bitcoin. I don't think Charlie Munger at age 98 has spent a hundred hours thinking about Bitcoin. If, I think that if Warren understood Bitcoin is digital property, which is a form of digital capital, if he understood that, he would go, oh yeah, it's just a dematerialized apartment. My choice is I, I buy a rental apartment or I buy a hundred acres in Kansas or I buy a Bitcoin, that's my choice. And can you get, you know, it's, by the way, it's, it's kind of silly to buy all the Bitcoin the whole point is to buy a small part of the Bitcoin, but it's, it's just as silly as saying, what if I could just own all the land in the world? 
well, you don't really want to own all the land in the world because you want other people in the world and the network that is that are motivated by ownership to trade with you. So I, I really think that's like the, the wrong way to think of it. The right way to think of it is, would I rather own a million dollars of apartments in New York City or a million dollars of land in Kansas or a million dollars of land in, in Nigeria or a million dollars of Bitcoin anywhere? And uh, can what can you do with property? You can rent it, you can develop it, or you can mortgage it. Can you do that with land? Yes. Can you do that with, uh, with a building? Probably. Can you do that with Bitcoin? Certainly. You can do it with all three of those. The difference is you can mortgage Bitcoin. You can borrow against Bitcoin from any bank in the world, whereas it's probably hard for you to borrow against uh, land in Central Africa from a bank in New York. They probably won't give you the mortgage. So it's hard to mortgage things that have physical nexus. Try to get a mortgage on your house in Ukraine or in Moscow right now, if you live in San Francisco, right? They'll laugh at you. So you can't mortgage physical properties so easily. Can you develop them, right? Sometimes, sometimes not, right? Try to develop your land in New York City if a politician decides that they don't want that to be developed, right? So you have political constraints on what you can develop, you have physical constraints on what you can mortgage. Can you rent it? Same issue, right? Which is you can't rent an apartment in New York City to someone in San Francisco. You can't rent something in Central Africa to a person living in Argentina. On the other hand, with Bitcoin, you could rent your Bitcoin on Saturday morning from Singapore to someone in Monaco. And on Sunday, you could rent it to someone in London and on Monday, you could move it over and rent it to someone in San Francisco. You could write a computer program to rent the Bitcoin. And it, it could be rented differently while you sleep. So you see, Bitcoin is actually better property. It's a better, it's a better gold than gold. It's a better property than property. It's a better money than most currencies. Why? Because it's digital. It's dematerialized. It's programmable. You can move it at the speed of light. It's indestructible, it's incorruptible. You're not gonna have to worry about waking up and finding that your house that you own in Barbuda got wiped out by the hurricane. You're not gonna find out that the mayor of some city rent controlled your apartment, right? You're not gonna find out that, uh, that nobody, you know, there's a drought. How much is your farmland worth when there's a drought, right? <laughs> you know, not that much. So you take on all sorts of risk and constraint with physical properties. Warren understands them because, because uh, he can touch them and he can feel them. He doesn't understand Bitcoin because he doesn't have a motivation to think about it. But, you know, Warren does understand one other thing, which is Coca-Cola. And Warren has held Coca-Cola. He's a Coca-Cola maximalist and a hodler for 40 years. And when you ask Warren... Why, you know, why Coca-Cola? By the way, can you improve on Coca-Cola protocol? It was invented a long time ago. Like it, how many people have come up with a sweeter, better, more interesting drink than Coca-Cola? It's not, you know, it's not a complicated idea. And yet Coca-Cola reigns uh, dominant. And what's the, what's the value proposition of Coca-Cola? It's the greatest beverage brand in the world. Maybe other than water. You got water and then you walk into a restaurant and they say, what do you want to drink? You say Coke or Diet Coke and they have it. Now try ordering Diet Dr. Pepper or Diet Mr. Pibb or Diet, you know, strawberry sarsaparilla and they look at you like you're crazy. Now here's the big idea. The idea of Coca-Cola is embedded in the heads of billions of people. If I wiped out all of the bottling plants of Coca-Cola, if I wiped out the manufacturing, the corporation, the executives, everything, and all the contracts, would Coca-Cola still have value? And the answer is yes. The only way for Coca-Cola not to have value is you have to rip it out of the heads of 8 billion people. If you could telepathically reach into the heads of all 8 billion people on the planet and and blank Coca-Cola from their mind, then maybe you've destroyed the brand. 
But the fact is people think Coca-Cola is synonymous with something that's safe to drink that I can order that I can get. And Bitcoin is synonymous with money. And it's, it's the greatest monetary brand. Right? So certainly if, if you know, water is to Coca-Cola as the dollar is to Bitcoin, you know, <laughs> in a way. And uh, some people just don't take the time to figure it out. I mean, you can't begrudge, you know, two business people that lived into their 90s for not grasping the new thing that the 20-somethings are figuring out. It's not, you know, when I, if I'm 90 years old or 92 or 98, you know, and you come along with some great telepathic, you know, implant and ask me my opinion, I might say, uh, you know, it kind of scares me. I'm not so sure about it. But, you know, so be it, right? I mean, like, my, it's not my job to, like, be up on every technology, you know, every minute of my life. People should be thinking for themselves on this matter and come to their own conclusions. So you touched on this um, a few times already, and I wanted you to really unpack it. Now, there's a way to take your cryptocurrencies, put them with, you know, different different store your currencies in different places and actually get a return from it to actually get an interest rate from it which is uh I, I would say relatively new because years ago you know we were looking at bitcoin as this thing where everybody's waiting on the next you know run up is is it 20,000 today is it 100,000 is it going to be a million and so on whereas now people have the ability to earn interest on that cryptocurrency. So I want to know a few things, if you have anything to say about the concern here that if I give my cryptocurrency, am I giving it away? Am I losing the rights to that cryptocurrency temporarily? And if that company were to go out of business or get hacked or something happens, do I then lose my digital currency? Do I lose that Bitcoin? Or, you know, there, there I know there are others that do this as staking and, and so on. If you just would sort of unpack that. Uh, I think if we come back to the issue of you own some land, a million dollars of land, you own a million dollar house, you own a million dollars of Bitcoin. Can you rent it? Yes. Is there risk? Yes. You could just keep the land for a hundred years and not rent it. Or you could rent it to someone and they could build, you know, they could build some manufacturing refinery on it and dump oil into it and get sued by the EPA. And it could be like a massive problem, right? And you could rent your house to someone, they could trash your house. Or you could not rent it. You could you could loan your Bitcoin to a counterparty and they could steal it. Okay, that's the risk. Right. Uh, there's lots and lots of counterparties. Do you trust the Bank of New York? Do you trust JP Morgan? Do you trust Goldman Sachs? Do you trust whatever? You got to figure out who you trust. Uh, would you would you rent your house to the CEO of Goldman Sachs? Maybe. Would you rent your house to some like, you know, crazy, you know, rock star that throws wild parties? Unclear. Right. It depends. So I, I think that this is kind of just a, a basic issue of property. Do you want to rent your property to someone else? How important, what, how much are they willing to pay you? You own a boat, you charter your boat. Someone takes the boat, they sink the boat. Do you regret, have, you know, do you loan your car to someone? They crash your car, right? These are all uh, basic issues you have to consider. There's a counterparty risk. I wouldn't recommend any one over any other one. I think there's a vibrant market. There's a lot of different companies in the space. And uh, the only thing that can be said for Bitcoin is, in theory, any of 100,000 companies could rent your Bitcoin, whereas you're not going to get 100,000 companies offer to rent your apartment or rent your farmland, right? There's probably two or three farmers that might want to rent your farmland. So the market is much more competitive and it's evolving much more rapidly. I would say that uh, you put your Bitcoin into a into a DeFi type crypto network. You know, it's probably a lot riskier than if you put your your Bitcoin with a counterparty that's a corporation. And that's riskier than putting it with a regulated corporation that's publicly traded. And that's riskier than putting it with an FDIC insured bank. So and that's riskier than just holding it in cold storage. MicroStrategy just holds our Bitcoin in cold storage 
we don't actually loan it out because we calculate that the counterparty risk exceeds the after-tax benefit of the yield. See, but it may not always, right? And, and that changes over time. I appreciate that. Oh, um, and other people don't agree with us, by the way. There are plenty of people that have a lot of Bitcoin and they lend it out for an 8% yield or a 12% yield pretty routinely, right? And that, or they lend it to a counterparty to get a loan. You could take a million dollars of Bitcoin, get a $250,000 loan at 0% interest right now. It's, you know, so, and then you take the $250,000 and buy something else with it. So that's kind of interesting, but there's counterparty risk. So caveat emptor, right? You know, you're an adult. You got to think for yourself and consider who do you trust? What kind of risk do you want to take? And the benefit is I could keep my Bitcoin for 100 years if I trust the bank that'll give me the loan. That's why we do, do business with bankers. And if I don't trust the banks, I don't take the loan. I don't, I don't post my Bitcoin with them. I keep it on a hardware wallet and I'm, I self-custody. So this is directly connected with Tether. Uh, no pun intended, but right. Tether is something that I've seen, you know, different videos and different posts and, and so on. And for those who aren't aware, Tether is what you would call a stable coin and correct me if I'm wrong, but you have these coins that are one-to-one -one with the US dollar. And essentially you can put your money in there. You can earn that, you know, if you would like to earn it, you know, uh, some sort of interest rate. And this would be sort of a new way to transact with sort of having the same value as a US dollar, but being able to move that around in, in the digital environments nice and easily and so on. I've heard a lot that Tether is sort of this, maybe, you know, I don't want to, I don't know enough about it to, to say much, but other than the fact that some say that this has never been audited. And there's a concern here that if this starts to be audited, regulated, and so on, that that would have a knock-on effect or a domino effect in the rest of the cryptos, including Bitcoin. So if you had any information on Tether and what it means, if it is to be regulated, um, what, do we, what would you say? Um, I think that, uh, that Tether is, an is the most successful stable coin. And there are two kinds of digital assets that everybody in the world wants. They want like a digital checking account and a digital savings account. So the ideal digital checking account would be the US dollar as a medium of exchange, circulating at the speed of light on mobile devices everywhere in the world. Tether is one choice. Circle is another stable coin. DAI is another stable coin. US, uh, UST is another stable coin. So that this is an exploding demand. Um, and the people that want it badly are the people in South America, Africa, Asia. If you're in Turkey and there's 70% inflation right now, then the cost of keeping your money in the lira is you lose 70% of your wealth. <laughs> So the question is, is it 70% likely that Tether will go to zero in the next 12 months? Because it's 100% likely that 70% of my wealth will go away if I hold my money in the local currency. So you see, from, from their point of view, they like the idea of the dollar. So what the stable coins offer is they offer people the chance to get dollars. And if you're in the US and you live in New York and you have a bank, this is an academic discussion for you. This is not for you. If you live in uh, Central African Republic, or you live in Nigeria, or you live in Afghanistan, or Iraq, or Lebanon, or Turkey, or Brazil, or Argentina, or Venezuela, right? This is not an academic discussion. It's a discussion of, are you holding Tether, or are you holding the local currency? And the second question is, well, how am I supposed to pay for something in dollars if you don't have a bank account? So the real appeal of stable coins is to bank the unbanked and provide people with access to dollars. And there's a huge, huge demand for that. Are there risks? Yeah, there are risks, right? Like uh, there's, which one do you wanna use? And, uh, and so if your choice was hold a million dollars at JP Morgan or hold a million dollars with Tether, clearly the, the rational choice is put your million dollars with an FDIC insured bank like JP Morgan. But when you live in Afghanistan and the banks close and your risk is 
starvation. What are you supposed to do? Carry a bar of gold around in your pocket? And how do you buy something halfway around the world with what? With silver coins? Like, so, so the people that are using this are using it because they don't have a bank. They don't have access to dollars. They don't have access to the Fed wire. There's, and so there's two issues. One is my local currency is going to zero. And the second is I don't have a bank and I can't transfer money. And so when you look at it through their lens, if I told you you were 50% likely or, or you were going to lose half of your money for sure within 12 months. And then I said, or there's this thing called Tether or this thing called Circle or DAI or, or another cryptocurrency, it looks like the dollar. Then, you know, you would say, well, is that is that 50 percent likely to fail? <laughs> you know, and then and it's like a coin flip. All right. And so I think that uh, that's why the, these are exploding. They've gone from like five billion dollars to 200 billion in market value and they'll keep growing uh, and there'll be different ones. There's a market competition. I don't think it has any impact one way or the other on Bitcoin. I mean, there's a little bit of FUD back and forth, but like my company bought $4 billion of Bitcoin. We didn't use Tether to buy it, right? We right. wired money into a bank. We bought the Bitcoin because we wanted the Bitcoin. Let's fast forward to the, to the future. You know, 10, 20 years from now, six to 8 billion people have a mobile phone. On that mobile phone, you know, it'd be nice to have some dollars. It'd be nice to have some BTC. The Bitcoin is like your digital gold or your store of value that you hold for your life. And the dollars is your medium of exchange. You use it to buy stuff, you know, buy coffee, pay for your Uber. You know, like if you're a tutor and you live in Africa and you sell your services to someone in Chicago, how are you going to get paid? <laughs> how do you get paid? You have no bank account. You have no payment network. Okay. Right, so if you reject the crypto economy, that person's supposed to roll over and die. Right? How, you know, or or maybe you want to live. So if you want to live, you get a computer, you plug in the internet, you get a digital wallet, you know, you teach you, you teach algebra to some yuppies kids in Chicago. You get paid twenty dollars an hour. You're happy. They're happy. It gets wired to you via some digital wallet. Maybe it's some stable coin like Tether. Maybe it's something else, right? I mean, well, the market will decide, but, but ultimately these are tools for people to, to trade with each other as a medium of exchange. And Bitcoin is a tool that serves as a store of value. And, and what does everybody on earth want? They want a medium of exchange and they want a store of value. And what do they, what do they have right now? They don't have it. Right now, billions of people don't have a medium exchange that works. They don't have a store of value that works. And, and so what does it cost me to give it to them? A $50 Android phone, a downloaded mobile app. Why is it spreading to millions of people every week? Why wouldn't it? Right? I mean, if, if your choice was, you know, starvation, impoverishment, or I download a mobile app and I have a chance and I have hope, and maybe I live happily forever after, I think I'm going to download the mobile app. People aren't stupid. Now, my last question for you is NFTs. So I separate NFTs into two categories. There's the NFTs that I believe have a lot of prime usage. For instance, um, you're buying a ticket to uh, you know the Super Bowl, and you can have your NFT ticket to make sure that this is, in fact the legitimate one and it wasn't counterfeit in any way and i could prove that it's there on the blockchain and then there's the nfts like board ape nfts and they get a lot of you know um publicity around them and so on and that's the, that's the way i see it but where do you see nfts fitting into all of this is it a lot of speculation or is this something you know that people are just interested in now because it's it's new and you know, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, I think NFT is a digital collectible, right? Bitcoin is like digital money. Um, and I think an NFT is a digital collectible, but in that way, it competes with other forms of art or other collect. I mean, do, I, do you want to buy baseball cards? Do you want to collect coins? Do you want to collect comic books? Do you want to collect books? Do you want to collect something? 
Do you want to collect NFTs? What do you want to collect? Um, there's a lot of things you can collect, right? They, they tend to be faddish, right? Like there was a while when people wanted to brag about their coin collection. You know, there's a while when people wanted to brag about their comic book collection. When people stop reading comic books, maybe they won't care so much about that. It uh, varies. So, I, I mean, I think um, it's very early. And uh, some things, some things have like a strong community effect, and and within that community, uh, people get excited. And I, you know, I, I guess you can't, uh, you can't dismiss that, but uh, you ought to look at them, you know, in that vein. I did, I generally think, if you want an uh, overarching theory, everyone's got a set of money, and one pool of the, uh, if you look at all the wealth you have. Some of it you want to allocate towards savings. And if you're going to save, you want to convert, you want to hold strong, scarce, desirable property for the rest of your life. That's what you save for 30 years or, or to give to your children or your children's children. That's one bucket. There's another bucket called investment. Someone's going to invest in a company or, or invest in something they expect to appreciate in value for good reason. Uh, there's risk. I mean, a certain type of risk with investment. Uh, with savings, you know, it's like I bought the farm, I'm holding it for 30 years. I'm not torturing myself every minute asking people what they'll pay me for the farm, right? It's just, it's just something I've decided I'm going to hold forever. Investments, you tend to, tend to be a little bit more uh, risky and there's more information and you can make right or wrong decisions. Then you've got, uh, you've got trading. Some people are traders. And it's a profession. It's like I bought this car because it's a limited edition, but I'm going to sell it. Or I bought this thing to sell it. And if you're the expert, right, in something, soybeans, corn, some people flip houses, right? Some people flip, you know, any collectible, right? You're a trade. If you're a really good trader, you know you are. If you're not, if you don't know, you know, people playing poker, right? They're kind of trading away. You're either good or you're not good. So. If you're good enough to trade and make money, then you do that. But uh, it's not a very good idea to trade things that you're not the expert on, right? So you better be the expert, you know? And then the last is speculation. You know, I just go, I go to the horse race and I bet on the race and I don't really know much about the horse, but I just want to have a bet because it's fun, you know? And or I bet on the game or maybe I go to Vegas and I play a game like, I play a game like, uh, like roulette where I know the odds are against me. Right. You could argue that in poker, maybe the odds are in your favor, but, you know, in roulette, you know, the odds are against you, but you play it anyway to be sociable. And so I think that if you think about all these, some things are investments, some things are more like savings. I tend to look at Bitcoin as a saving. Uh, the maximalist think Bitcoin is a savings technology. The technocrats think Bitcoin is an investment. The traders think Bitcoin is just a trade, right? They're, just, they're shorting it and going long based on what they think the interest rates will do, right? And, um, and, and everybody uh, can be any of those categories with regard to something, depending on their, their knowledge and their conviction. With regard to NFTs, right? It's not my, my field, so I don't study them all very carefully. And so I don't have strong opinions you know, as to whether it's a speculation or a trade or whether it's an investment or whether it's, it's, it's something different. I, I leave that to people that are expert in that field. I appreciate that. I uh, appreciate it. all of your time today. I know my subscribers, um, they absolutely requested you coming on. I've been hearing from people for, you know, quite a while saying, bring Michael Saylor on, talk about Bitcoin. So, uh, I had one little thing. Now, I want you to tell people where they can find out more. And one of those places I found out was michael.com. And I'm interested when you got that domain. Yeah, I bought a lot of domains. I bought michael.com. I bought Emma. I bought Hope. I okay. bought Angel. I bought was Alarm. This back Back in the back bank? in the in the 90s, okay, in the late <laughs> in the late 90s, between like 94 and 2000. Oh wow, okay. Something there I bought up a bunch of those domain names. I just thought it was cool. Yeah. I bought Courage, you know? Okay. Like all sorts of interesting ones. But my, and I bought Hope. 
So uh, if you want more about me, well, michael.com is my website. If you want to know more about Bitcoin, hope.com is a website with curated stuff on Bitcoin. Um, just remember Bitcoin is hope. Uh, if you want uh, my commentary, uh, I every day I, I generally post thoughts about uh, what's going on in the market economy, and especially Bitcoin on Twitter. My handle is Sailor, S-A-Y-L-O-R. Just find, you'll, you'll find me there. And then uh, I've got a free course. I offer free education. Uh, I've got a foundation called the Sailor, uh, the Sailor Academy that offers a free college education online. Anybody, we've had more than a million students. And uh, we've got a free course, Bitcoin for Everybody. It's 12 hours long. It's free to anybody. If you really want get to cer get certified and learn, you go to sailor.org and uh, you'll find it there. And uh, otherwise, you know, uh, I wish everybody the best. I, I would say that Bitcoin is digital energy in the same way that electricity is electrical energy or steel is metallic energy and oil is chemical energy. It's a profound breakthrough in the history of humanity, but you wouldn't expect someone to understand it without putting in the time and the effort. I think after about 10 hours, you have an inkling of what's going on. After 100 hours, you start to have a good feel for it. After 1,000 hours, you've mastered it. You know, and you, and you can figure out what you're going to do with it. Most people don't have the time, but I, but I would recommend that, that uh, before you invest your money, you invest your time because it's, uh, it's one of the few things in the, in the year 2022 that you can learn that could be really, really beneficial to you. There's a lot of other things you can learn that, that aren't going to make you money or lose you money one way or the other. They're just entertainment or they're, or they're just ways to spend the time. But, but Bitcoin is worth figuring out at this time and this decade because it is pretty profound. All right, Michael, thank you very much for coming on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me, David. Take care.